I had a chance last week with the U-Star Governing Authority to go out and visit the Bioinnovation Gateway Center out at Granite School District, which is a joint venture of Granite Schools and um, Salt Lake Community College. And I definitely saw that as an educator. And one of the things that I talked to the person who's running the program about is what a wonderful program it is in the sense that everybody who's in that program can win. They learn their math, they learn their science, and ap actually application in the biotech center. There are no losers in that center. And their dropout rate, they actually see it as a great vehicle for rescuing people from dropping out. I think that um, the high high school dropout rate that we're having that just seems to be getting worse every time we try to fix it, it gets worse, is uh, symptomatic of an unproductive conformity and competition that we're encouraging in our schools. I think we need to think very differently about it. The final enemy, I think, of creativity is what I will call the giant hairball. If you have not read the book by Gordon McKenzie called Orbiting the Giant Hairball, the giant hairball is the bureaucracy. And he points out that in any company, bureaucracy is very necessary. It provides resources and structure, but it is not a place to cultivate creativity and genius. And what he talks about is how do you orbit the hairball? You don't want to leave the hairball. You want to go into orbit around the hairball. And I wonder how many of our organizations, as we think about at an organizational level, fostering genius and creativity, have really thought about how that relates to um, our organization. We have a lot of ex famous examples of people who exited and got outside. Um, the, the Skunk Works at, at Lockheed, uh, the Apple Macintosh team ran up a pirate flag over their uh, headquarters when they were working on that. Um, one of my experiences in higher education uh, was uh, I was doing some work at UT Southwestern Medical School in Dallas, Texas, and I was asking them about you know program innovation, and one of the uh, gentlemen there said, well, don't you understand that we exist in a system we call a thousand points of no, uh, that everyone tells you no. One of the things that Gordon McKenzie talks about in his book, Orbiting the Giant Hairball, and he was a creative director at Hallmark Cards, and he talks about how does the creative side of that business coexist with the giant hairball. And um, it, it was slightly annoying to him, but as his career advanced, they absolutely insisted that he move into top management. And he really didn't want to, but he, he was so senior in the company that they kind of were bothering him about it. So he said he would, um, he would agree to go into top management uh, if and only if he got to pick his own title. So they said fine. And so he picked as his title Corporate Paradox. And he said, uh, Corporate Paradox, nobody knew what it was. He actually didn't know what it was. And so he set up his office and sat there and waited to see what would happen. And what happened is people would come to him and they would explain their new ideas and ask him to tell them yes. And so he decided that in a system that was a thousand points of no, what he could do is tell everybody yes. Now he said he was challenged at a seminar of, well, are all these ideas good ideas? And he said, oh no, they're not all good ideas. And I said, well, why are you telling them yes? And he said, well, because if I tell them yes, they'll work on them, and they'll make them better, and they'll get feedback, and they'll become good ideas. And so he saw his role in that organization as being the yes man. And people who found their way to him and had puzzled over who was the corporate paradox, he didn't know, they didn't know, but for five years he just told everybody yes and was a celebrated figure inside Hallmark. Where is the yes in your organization? Because it's not just about what's happening in folks as they go through school and, and the, maybe the demoralization that happens there, but how is genius and creativity in organizations supported as well? So uh, let me close and say what in our organizations and our schools and our social environment supports genius. I don't have any really great answers on this other than I think this is a great question and one it's very important we confront because I think we're off track. I had in my academic career uh, a great friend, um, a Frenchman named um, um, Jacques, um, Jacques Delacroix, I almost said Jacques Cousteau, Jacques Delacroix, 
And um, we used to get together and argue on a regular basis. He was uh, actually worked uh, for Texas Instruments and Strategic Planning. And we got together today, we were arguing about one book, and he got very frustrated with me, and he said, you know, the problem with you Americans is you think all questions must have answers. You have absolutely no respect for questions. So we argued about that, but about a day later it dawned on me that he had said something extremely important, that a really great question, if you don't have an answer, a really great question is worthy in its own right. And so my question to you is, where are the geniuses of 20, 30, and 40 years from now? And are we doing things that are really working against that goal? I think that there are some things that are fundamentally off track. We definitely have in education uh, an obligation to start providing answers to that. But everything that the way I think about things we've done at the David Eccles School of Business is to actually give people that quest for and desire to learn. My wife, when I was teaching at one point uh, preschool, and she thought her preschooler should have a little science. So she got these little science things, and they were all play activities. And one of the activities was to put food color in little dishes and let the little kids have eyedroppers. These are three-year-olds. Of course, they loved the eyedroppers, and they would mix the colors together, and they would learn that uh, red and blue makes purple. Um, simultaneously, my son was in kindergarten, and they were reading books to learn their colors. And there's this beautifully illustrated book, we have it in our home collection as well, called White Rabbit. And White Rabbit jumps in different colors of paint and comes out different colors. And uh, several weeks into the term, the kindergartners still hadn't learned their colors. They, didn't, they could read about it, they could look at it. And my wife said, let me bring in a play table activity. Let's let them experience it. Let's let them have the bioinnovation gateway experience of actually doing it. Uh, within one day, all the kindergartners had learned their colors and had all the three-year-olds as well. And uh, I worry in our education system, and it's, it's us doing it to the teachers. I don't see teachers being great uh, advocates of teaching the test and more testing and more testing and emphasis on content. Uh, I do fear a great deal. My kids are in seventh grade and eleventh grade. You know, what are they actually learning at the end of the day? What are they walking away with? What's going to be left over after everything they learned is gone? And so that is my question for you. I have no great answers on it. I plan to spend a little time on it. But if there is a group of people who should care, it's the geniuses of today to make sure that there are some uh, to, to recognize in the future. Thank you very much.